Welcome to our service, everyone. How I miss our people and our miss, I miss our gathering together when we come together and worship our great God. And hopefully, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll get back together and we'll be able to worship as a church body, as a church family, and uh, we will see each other in person. But I miss you all, and I do pray for you, and I do wish that you are using this time uh, to grow spiritually and to know the Lord more. Again, a couple of announcements. We will continue 9 a.m. every Sunday, um, online services. Please tune in. Uh, we will continue to preach the gospel. We also continue to have our Bible studies online. Please reach out to me or to the guys from our college Bible study. And uh, you're welcome to join us. We are there every week. Before we begin our service, I want to read from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, and Romans 15, 13. Today, I want to talk uh, today uh, in my sermon about true happiness and true joy. And I think these passages are so good articulating that we can be joyful and fully satisfied in God even when we go through the, the hardest of trials. Let me read Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And the next passage is from Romans 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray and ask the Lord's blessings on this service. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We're so thankful that we know you through Jesus Christ, that we can trust in you and we can put all our confidence in your word, in your promises, in your purposes. And Lord, by trusting in you, Lord, we can derive hope and joy and peace no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what is happening in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for being a rock. We can be joyful in you. You are enough and sufficient for our joy, for our delight, for our pleasure, for our satisfaction. Lord, we pray that you would bless our people, all the people who know Christ, that we may rejoice in you and you alone, that we would not find joy in anything else outside of you. And even in the gifts that you have given us, that we would also rejoice in you primarily. And thank you for the gifts that you have given us. And we pray that you would bless our people, Lord. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in you even in this difficult season in our lives. And we want to pray for this country. We want to pray for uh, our governing authorities that you would bless them, Lord, on the federal level, on the state level, that you would give them wisdom, give them humility, Lord, and bless them, Lord. And uh, they have to make very important decisions. And we pray that you would bless them and be with them, guide their minds. We also pray that you would bless everyone who is serving right now in this very difficult time, especially the medical workers, that you would protect them, that you would bless them, that you would support them and strengthen them, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless everyone else who is involved in helping and in working for the benefit of others. Lord, we most importantly want to see a revival. We want to see people come back to their faith in Christ. We want to see this country return and repent of their sins, of their evils, what we have done as a country, as a nation, that we would trust in Christ again, repent of our sin, and be forgiven, and return to your word as authority for our lives. Bless, Lord America. Bless, Lord Next couple of weeks, Lord, uh, we pray that you would help us and we pray that uh, you would help us get back to our normal lives, that we would worship together uh, in one place gathered 
and uh, would enjoy each other's presence and fellowship. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Good morning, church. What a privilege it is to come together in the spirit in our homes with our families to worship our Lord and Savior. So join us in these praises. as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved Dying, saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. They, they led him up Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him to die on a tree Suffering anguish, despised and rejected Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He And hands that heal nations shout on a tree and took nails for me. That he had conquered Now he has ascended My Lord evermore Death cannot hold him The grave cannot keep him From rising again Oh, glorious day, 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your son, Jesus Christ, for the work that you have fulfilled on Calvary's Hill, Lord. We thank you so much that you have taken all of our sin and you nailed it on the cross and you said you are forgiven, child. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and love for us and let us praise your name forever and ever because you are worthy of all the praise and honor. Lord, let us just worship you till the end of our days. Your name we pray, amen. God, in all of his glory and all of his power and might, thought of us and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the sinful world, to live a perfect life, to be beaten, to be mocked, and nailed onto a cross where he bore all the sins of the world, all the sins he has taken from us and nailed it on the cross. God put it all on his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ defeated that sin. When he rose from the dead, he defeated death. He defeated sin and death, and he gives us life. He gives us a hope that we may also be resurrected in him and defeat death as well. So let us just sing this song as we praise our Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he has done on this earth for us. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah.
blessed Redeemer. The topic of my message this morning is true happiness. True happiness, where to find it and how to keep it. Dictionary.com defines happiness as the state of being happy, experiencing pleasure, contentment, and joy. And I'll try to answer the questions where we can find the true, deep, and lasting happiness and th that happiness that does not de depend on circumstances of life. The true happiness, the true joy that we can find even when we go through troubles and challenging challenges in life. This is especially relevant taking into account the crazy time that we live in. Coronavirus is upon us with vengeance, especially in Philadelphia. It has a global impact. It will take years and even decades to recover, according to many experts. We live in challenging times, many bad news. People hear, uh, people get sick, people are dying, people are losing their jobs. Economies are crushing. Relational conflicts abound in families as they're stuck in their houses. There's much fear, much dread, much sadness, much sorrow, conflict, grief, misery across the globe especially in U.S. We were the richest, the wealthiest, the most comfortable, the most safest country in the world, probably. And now things are changing. Where do people turn to find peace and happiness to their souls during this pandemic? So some people, according to um, <clears throat> some statistics, they turn to comedies and comedians. They want to laugh. They want to experience some joy. They want to put a smile on their, on their face. They want to escape the harsh reality of this life. But we know the comedies and comedians, it's a, it's a very superficial help with your anxiety and with your fear and with your unhappiness. New York Times uh, ran an article this week on people getting... Uh, into on Instagram, and they are looking for uplifting headlines. In, on Instagram, there are some profiles that, that uh, spread good news, and people really want good news. They are tired of bad news. They're feel, they feel terrified. They feel discouraged. They feel anxious. They want to be hopeful. They want to have a reason to go on and not to give up. So those Instagram accounts that promote the good, good headlines they are becoming very popular. People want to find peace in this time of pandemic. Psychology professor Lori Santos from Yale University, she leads a happiness lab in, at Yale. Uh, she was asked, how do you keep your spirits up during this pandemic, how to do that? And this, uh, these are her advices. So let's see what the world is, to off, is offering people to cope with challenging times. How to be happy, how to be peaceful. Number one, meditation. Meditate. Meditate, focus on breathing, focus on mantra, a special phrase that you repeat in your head, and try to focus your mind. Don't get your mind, get distracted. distracted. Try to quiet your mind. Also, this professor said, make time for social connections online. Also, she was uh, suggest, su suggesting to help other people, like buy grocery for elderly people or for those who are in need. 
take walks, spend time with the family, exercise, delete social media accounts. That's one of her suggestions. And she started a, an online class on well-being, on happiness, how to be happy during this time, how to cope with this challenging time we are facing as a country. So she launched this class, online class, and 1.4 million people signed up for it. A lot of people. And this class promises to deal with anxiety, uncertainty, and anger. This is the best that this world can offer. Again, in pandemic, people realized they cannot trust money. They realized wealth doesn't help. They realized that popularity and greatness also doesn't help. They realized that learning and education and intelligence also doesn't help to cope with this pandemic. They realized that idleness doesn't help as well. People are tired being idle doing nothing. They're going crazy in their houses. People realize that happiness is not in all these things. Happiness should be sought somewhere else. So all that the world offers, brothers and sisters, it's short-lived, it's unstable, and it ends at death. Death is a harsh reality that will hit all of us and all the happiness and all the, the trust that you put in this, these things, hobbies and families and all those things, it will fail at one point. So I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper what the Bible says about true happiness. True happiness, the Bible defines as all satisfying joy that lasts forever. It's the greatest intensity of joy and it never ends. That's true happiness, okay? And this world cannot offer this, this kind of happiness. So I want to offer you four truths about happiness. We'll just go one after another, four truths about happiness. And at the end, I want to talk to Christians specifically how to keep that joy in Jesus. So number one, the first truth about happiness is this. Everyone lives for happiness. Everyone lives for happiness. Everyone makes decisions in life to be happy, to be joyful. We are hardwired by God, designed by God to, to seek happiness. To be peaceful, to have that joy. It's built in in our system by God. People, as we witness right now during this pandemic, they can pay the highest price to feel safe, secure, and peaceful and happy. They will sell their soul if you promise them all these things. So you are made for joy. You are made for happiness. The philosopher Blaise Pascal said the following, all human beings seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same decision in both, attended with different views. The human will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. This is a human need and human desire to be happy. We are driven by that desire. The goal of every individual is to be happy. John Piper also says that it's a law of human heart planted in our heart by God. It's like the law of gravity uh, is the law of nature. God made us this way, and it's a great thing. It's a good thing. We should pursue happiness. We should pursue happiness. I don't want you to think that I am against happiness. I am for happiness. Pursue all the joy, all the happiness you can possibly have, but pursue it in the right source. That's the key. So when we read the Bible, and uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look in Genesis, or open to Genesis chapter 1. From the beginning, God created humanity, Adam and Eve, to be happy. He made them to be happy. 
Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God creates them as a family, as, a, as a, that little um, society, men and women, Adam and Eve, and he blessed them, verse 28. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over it, over all animals and fish and birds and, and all the creatures. And have babies, be multiply. Be fruitful. And God said that everything that he created was very, very good. God blessed men and women, and he wanted them to be happy. And their happiness is rooted in their fellowship with God. Adam and Eve, they had that direct, intimate fellowship with God. They were obedient to him. And they derived joy, satisfaction, pleasure, delight from God. Genesis 3.8 says that God was moving in the Garden of Eden during the breezy time of the day and they would fellowship with Adam and Eve. They would meet God. There was probably some kind of a visible manifestation of God and they would have that intimate communion and there was the pure joy that they experienced with God. God made us, brothers and sisters, with God-shaped void in our hearts. And we are never happy outside of God. Also, you see, Adam and Eve, they were in tune with God, so intimate that they were happy within themselves. Adam and Eve, they, they were so happy together. It was the best marriage. You remember that Adam was created first during the day, on the sixth day, God created Adam first, and then he was naming the animals. But then Adam realized that I'm lonely. And I see all these animals and there's no one to complete me, no one to actually help me, and no one to, to have someone, some fellowship and some joy with. And God saw it, and God created Eve. You remember the story, God put Adam to sleep, took a rib from his chest, fashioned a woman, and brought her to Adam. And Adam was blown away by the beauty of his bride. You remember what he cried out, this is at last, finally, bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And then from that point on, they had never-ending honeymoon before they sinned. They enjoyed one another. It was the perfect marriage. No conflicts, no issues, no differences, only bliss, only happiness, only joy, pleasure in each other. Perfect compatibility of different roles of manhood and womanhood, perfectly combined. And then God, not only they had this joy with God, they, they had joy with one another, but also they had joy with the environment with the creation. God placed them in this garden. It was an amazing place. It was the perfect oasis, the perfect haven. Everyone, first of all, was vegetarian, so no one was killing anybody. And also, every imagine all the animals and all the insects and all the plants and all the ground was so submissive and yielding to Humans and humans, it was a joy to work the ground. It was a joy to uh, take care of the garden. It was a pure joy. So God created us to experience that joy and happiness. First of all, in him, but also in, in each other and with the nature, within the environment. Everything was joy. Everything was peace, satisfaction, pleasure. There was no fear. There was no anxiety, no distress, no sadness, no depression, pain, suffering, and no death. God made us to be happy. He made you to be happy. Happiness is a good thing. Pursue your happiness. It's a good desire, and we must pursue it with all our might. That's number one. First truth, you are made to be happy. Second truth, God is the all-satisfying, eternal source of happiness. God is the all-satisfying, eternal source of happiness. That's second point. Again, I already mentioned that. 
that Adam and Eve found the joy with God and they derived that true, pure joy from him. But so many people in our day, most of the people, I, could, uh, I, I, could, I, I, could, I can't say, they derive joy not from God. So many people in our culture, they think God is boring. They think God is the greatest killjoy. That God is a judge and he is not happy. This is the biggest lie that Satan spreads around and it's not true. The Bible says that the most happy being in the universe is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they enjoy the pure joy and pure fellowship and perfect harmony with one another. They're infinitely and eternally happy. God is the greatest joy. God has the greatest joy for all the time, for all eternity. So as humans, we derive that joy when we are in tune with God, when we are connected to God, when we have that fellowship with Him. Apart from God, there is no joy. If you doubt this truth, that apart from God, there is no joy, you need to re read the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is the book from the, in the Old Testament where a king of Israel, Solomon, he was the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most wise uh, king at that time. And he had this experiment to test, to test the ple uh, with the pleasures, everything. And he found that everything was vanity. Everything was empty apart from God. Let me just read to you very quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1. 1 through uh, 11. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So his, his, his goal was to test pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility or vanity. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored of my, my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. And then he goes on to talk about his wealth, houses and vineyards he built, gardens and parks and ponds of water. And then verse 7 I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than any who preceded me in Jerusalem. He was so wealthy. He had everything, and he tried to find pleasure in all those things. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities. So this is his conclusion which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was no profit under the sun. He experimented. He wanted to put all his energy and all his possessions and all his wisdom to see what is pleasure. Can we find pleasure in all these things? And he could not. He was so disappointed and he says, everything is vanity. Everything is emptiness. All pleasure and all joys of life are vanity outside of God. And that's what you see, verse 11, he says, there's no profit under sun. Under sun means apart from God. Under this, on this planet, on this earth, apart from God, everything is empty if you try to find pleasure and joy in things apart from God. Without God, every joy is transient, very short-lived, 
empty and does not truly satisfy. Apart from God, there is no true joy, no true happiness. And, and every generation, I think, sees comedians and those who make people laugh and they die from suicide. They die from depression. They go and seek therapists and help because they're miserable even though they make other people laugh. Proverbs 14, 13 precisely talks, talks about laughter being, being also pretty empty and brings also some pain. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain or be, be sad, and the end of joy may be grief. People can be joyful and laughing and being so funny, but then when in private, they can go and be so depressed and so discouraged and so dark. Fall into darkness of their discouragement. Comedians, as I said, they are a great example of the fact that laughter and humor does not provide joy. True joy, true and lasting joy that can pull you through darkest times of your life and gives you peace to your conscience and joy when you go to bed by yourself and you're in private with your thoughts and you're at peace. Nothing can give apart from God. And even, even all the other gifts, again, our joy should be in God, but all the other gifts like family, like friends, like work, like riches, like pleasures and hobbies, all those gifts of God also should be enjoyed in relationship to God. We derive the greatest pleasure from family, from friends, from hobbies, from, from e eating food, from everything when we are, when we are thrilled with God. When we derive joy from God, we enjoy the rest of the gifts as a result as well. The Bible says God is the only source of true happiness. Psalm 16, 11, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence, in God's presence, is the fullness of joy. Fullness of joy means the greatest intensity to the infinity. The greatest intensity of joy is in the presence of God. In your hand, there are pleasures forever, which means for all eternity. So the greatest intensity of joy for all eternity, that's God. God only can give this joy to people. Psalm 43, 4, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. God, my exceeding joy. This, this is a phrase, my exceeding joy, in Hebrew, uh, literally reads this, this way. To God, the joy of my happiness. God is the joy of my happiness, the psalmist is saying. That's why, brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, our eternal life is, is not only eternal, the eternal life that we are hoping to have in heaven, it's not about the longevity. Yes, it's going to be eternal, never ending. But also it's about the quality of life. The quality of life. It's the best, the most satisfying, satisfying the most pleasant life ever. To be in the presence of God is to enjoy infinite pleasures and infinite joy. Revelation 21, 23. And the city has no need of a son. That's the city, the new Jerusalem in eternity. Has no need of a sun or of a moon to shine on it for the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the lamb. People will be so thrilled with God's glory and so rejoicing in him being glorified that we will be completely lost in his presence, completely lost in our joy. We will find this joy so satisfying, eternally, infinitely satisfying for the whole eternity. That's eternal life. Joy forevermore to the fullest extent. That's eternal life. Eternal death or hell is the opposite. Not only God will pour out his righteous anger, but also 
he will be absent in his glory and in his presence. If you remove God from a place and you uh, and he's sending his wrath, that's hell. Absence of God and the unleashing of his righteous wrath on sinners who have not submitted their lives to Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 God will, Jesus will come back dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So number one, God made you to be happy. Number two, God made you to be happy in God. God is the source, the only source of happiness, the only source of joy. Apart from God, is hell. With God, in his immediate presence, is heaven, is eternal life. The third truth is we have lost our happiness as a result of our rebellion and our sinful hearts are twisted. We twist happiness. You know the story, what happened. We failed to be happy. Adam and Eve, they were happy. Perfect fellowship with God, as I described. And they did not obey God. They rebelled against God. They defied God. They broke the relationship with God. You know what happened? Satan tempted Eve through a, sa a serpent and Eve gave in to temptation and the rest is history. Men and women, they rebelled against God. They failed to trust God. They failed to trust God's word when God said, do not eat from this tree. And they also fail to depend on God, to have their will and their happiness depending on God. Now they are creating their own thing, their own will, their own happiness. Adam and Eve basically said, you know what? We don't trust God's word and not trusting God's word. We want to create our own world and be our own gods, have our own will and our own happiness outside of God. And this is rebellion. Sin, the definition of sin is this, exchanging God's word and God's glory with your own words and ideas and your own self and your own glory and pursuing your own pleasures, pleasures of sin. That's what sin is. Adam and Eve, they exchanged God as a source of joy for a substitute, which is self and sin. And now we are born sinners. We are born sinners, selfish, self-willed. We pursue our own happiness. We don't want God. The true God of the Bible, we don't want him. We may like the idea of God and we can say, yeah, I believe in God. But the true God of the Bible, we don't like him. We want him to be there in the Bible. It's just a nice idea for some people, for some crazy evangelicals, but not for me. Men and women rebelled against God. This is what John Piper writes about this rebellion. The creator of the universe is infinitely worthy of respect and admiration and loyalty. Therefore, failure to love him is not trivial. It is treason. It defames God and destroys human happiness. We rejected God. We spit him in the face, so to speak and we destroyed our own human happiness by doing it. Now we are all born in sin. Sin pollutes every area of our being, our minds, our affections, our will, and we try to, to be independent from God. We don't want to be with God. We don't want to submit our lives to Him. We want to have our own happiness in our own corner. And it's impossible to have the true happiness and the true joy. And then we read that the, uh, the nation of Israel, they did exactly the same thing as Adam and Eve. Nation of Israel, they exchanged God for sin, for idols, and they worshiped idols. Jeremiah 2.12 and 13 uh, talks about this exchange, and I want to read you these two verses. 
Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew or to dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So this is what happened. Israel, uh, in Israel, it's very important to have water because it's such a, a arid place. It's very hot place and you need to have water to survive. And the best source of water in Israel is the living water. The living water is the, the running water. You have the spring and the spring gets you that water. It's fresh, it's pure, it's cool, it's permanent, it's clear, it's reliable. That's the living water. It's drinkable, it's satisfying, especially just to remember yourself in summer, you come home and you drink that glass of cold water from your refrigerator. It's so good. That's God. Living pure spring water. And they exchanged God for a broken cistern that can hold no water. So what they had at that time, they had these cisterns and cisterns were large pits they were digging in, into the ground and, and they, would plast, they were plastered to make sure the water doesn't, doesn't leave that place. And that cistern uh, was used to, to uh, accumulate some, some uh, raining water. And usually that water was uh, pretty bad quality, very muddy, not drinkable. It, it would go bad quickly. Also, it was unreliable. Sometimes you, that plaster would, would have a crack in it and would, water would leak out. And that's exactly what happened here. Israel, they replaced God with their idols, which is in this imagery, all these cisterns that, help, that, that can hold no water. And um, they committed this unpardonable sin. Sin that God, that's where God judged them and sent them to the, to the exile, to Babylon. So all people, all people who are born on this planet, they're doing exactly the same thing. We exchange God and his glory for our own broken sisters, for our own gods, for our own pleasures, for our own pursuits. And we try to find in them lasting fulfillment. We all exchange the infinite, all satisfying joy in God for a broken system that cannot satisfy. It's dirty, it's muddy, and it leaks out. When you need water, it's not there. That's what sin does. And I want you to look in your heart, listener. Look in your heart and ask yourself, what do you treasure the most in your life? What are you the most excited about? What do you value mostly in your life? What do you worship? What do you think? What occupies your mind? What do you always think about? What gives you the most joy, most happiness? That's your idol. That's your God. It can be food. It can be body figure. It can be reputation or fame. It can be relationships, video games, sports, Pleasures, success, wealth, family can be good things. Sex, a spouse, a future spouse, alcohol, drugs, and all the other things. If you cherish something and value something more than God, that's sin and that's an idol. And all those things that I just listed, they will never satisfy. They will never give you true joy. You will be a broken cistern at the end of your life. Tim Chalice, one of a, blo a blogger, he writes the following on this, on, on that satisfaction. And he's asking his, his readers, what is it? What is your idol? What are you seeking satisfaction in? Is it money? You will never have a bank account rich enough to satisfy you. Is it food? You will never have a meal filling enough to satisfy you. Is it pleasure? You will never have a sexual experience gratifying enough to satisfy you. 
Is it popularity? You will never have enough friends to satisfy you. Is it stuff? You will never accumulate enough possessions to satisfy you. Is it pornography? You will never find a person naked enough to satisfy you. Is it control? You will never have enough authority to satisfy you. Is it leisure? You will never have enough rest to satisfy you. Is it success? You will never achieve enough to satisfy you. Is it freedom? You will never be lawless enough to satisfy you. Nothing satisfy, satisfies apart from God. To know God and to love Him and to be thrilled with Him, to rejoice in Him and to value Him supremely. That's the true joy. But we lost it. We lost it. So number one, you were created to rejoice and created to be happy. Number two, God is the only source. Number three, we lost it. In, our, in Adam and Eve, we all sinned. And the fourth truth is God purchased our happiness by sending his son. This is the good news of the gospel. God purchased our happiness and our joy and our salvation and forgiveness from sins also by sending his son. This is the great news of the gospel. God is the judge of a universe. He must punish sin. And when we rebelled, that rebellion is infinite evil. And God must punish. He is a just God. He is the judge of a universe. He cannot leave the guilty unpunished, the Bible says. He must punish sin. And the reaction towards sin is his holy and righteous anger. God is anger with the wicked every day, the Bible says. He's just, and his justice must be exalted, must be uh, demonstrated. God cannot sweep sin under the rug, so he demands the payment to be made. So all rebels must be judged, and all of us are rebels. We, as I said, we sinned in Adam and Eve and we rebelled with them and we're born rebels. We deserve to be miserable. We deserve to be unhappy. We deserve to be punished with infinite wrath of God for our sin. We, we, we dishonored the glorious God of the universe. Of course we deserve all that. Of course we deserve hell. But as I said, the good, the good news is God loved humanity. God so loved humanity that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever trusts in him, they don't perish in misery and death. They have eternal life. They have true joy with God in the presence of God for eternity so that everyone who trusts in Christ may not perish but have eternal life. That's the gospel. God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He was born of a woman and he lived a perfect life and he died for the sins of his people and he absorbed the wrath of God that his people deserve. And God raised him on the third day and he seated him on the right hand of God, reigning now in glory and soon is coming back to judge the world. That's the gospel. God has done it. He loved humanity and he wanted us to be partakers of his joy. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they have so much joy and purity and happiness within them. He wanted us to be a part of it for eternity. That's why he sent his son and he reconciled the world to himself, even though we deserve to be in misery for eternity. God reconciled the world to himself through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Through Jesus, we have reconciliation with God. We know God and we can enjoy God through Christ. But don't forget, the Christian joy is a costly joy. This joy was, blood by, was bought by the blood of the Lamb, by, by the blood of Jesus. Our joy is not superficial. We may go through trials and we may go through suffering and we may be sorrowful, but there's always this joy under, under your heart, always supporting you. 
It's bought by the blood of a lamb. It's costly. It's serious. It's a rock that we always have. That's why we can smile even at the face of death. It's not as superficial. It doesn't depend on conditions of life or on circumstances of life. It's a rock. How do you get this joy? How do you get reconciled with God? By trusting in Christ. By repenting of your sin, of the things that you value more than God. You repent of them. You turn away from valuing your pleasures of sin more than God. And you acknowledge that you have failed to trust God. That you have failed to honor God. You have failed to value God supremely. And you trust in Christ. And you look on the cross and you put your trust that on the cross he took your sin. And and all the punishment that you deserve, he paid for you on your behalf. You turn from sin, from the delights of this life, of this sinful, of your sinful lifestyle. And you trust in Christ that on the cross he paid for your rebellion. And you find your joy in Jesus Christ and he becomes your treasure. And he's calling you today. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. True peace, true joy, true happiness. Take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your soul. You don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to be miserable in your sin. You can have true joy in Jesus Christ if you trust in him with all your heart and you see on the cross and you look on the cross and you see all your sin nailed there and being paid for. You put your trust in him, he promises to give you true joy. In conclusion, I want to end um, speaking to Christians. If you are in Christ, if you are a true believer in Christ, You can have that true and lasting joy and you have that and you know it personally. Your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled with God. You enjoy the presence of Christ and Jesus Christ is your source of happiness. And that joy is there even when you go through persecution, even when you go through suffering, even when you go through sickness and even death. That joy is a rock never shaking the joy in Jesus John 15 11, Jesus is telling to his disciples these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full that infinite joy of Jesus Christ with the Father and the Holy Spirit was given to us and we can have that joy in Christ that's the joy that, Jesus, that, that Christians have. And uh, Christians should live a joyful life. We should be marked by joy. That's what, uh, that, that was the mark of a, of a church in Jerusalem in the first century. Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit continually. That's the mark of a Christian. You find your joy in Jesus Christ. Augustine said the following, If I were to ask you why you have believed in Christ, why you have become Christians, every man will answer truly for the sake of happiness. You come to Christ because you want to be happy in Christ because Jesus is your object of your joy. John Flavel, the the Puritan, said the following, Jesus Christ is the object of believers' joy. Take away the knowledge of Christ and Christians would be the most sad and depressed beings in the world. Christ is the source of joy for a Christian. So if you don't have that joy in him, if you don't have that pleasure in Christ, if he's not a treasure and valuable for you, you probably are not a Christian. You're not a Christian. A true Christian rejoices in the presence of Christ. He regards him as valuable. He wants to know him more. And as they grow in the knowledge of Christ, they rejoice 
more and more. But it's not easy. It's not easy to be joyful in Jesus Christ. It's a battle that we have to fight every day. Great men of God throughout the history of a church, they said it's the greatest battle in their lives to be truly happy in Christ. It's not easy. John Newton said the following, if I may speak from my own experience, I find that to keep my eyes simply upon Christ as my peace and my life is by far the hardest part of my calling. It's so hard to be happy in Christ, to keep our eyes on him all the time. And how do we do, do, we do that? We do that by looking unto Jesus, by fixing our eyes on Christ by getting to know him on the pages of a Bible, by seeing him in the Gospels, in the Old Testament being prophesied, in the Gospel, we see him in his earthly ministry. And then on the cross, we see him dying for, for our sins. And then in the resurrection, raising and conquering death. And then we see him in the epistles being explained and all the riches of Christ being unfolded. Study God's word and again, look for Christ and always Point your eyes to him. Hebrews 12, 2 precisely admonishes us and calls us to fix our eyes on Christ so that we don't drift away into sin. Sin is always at our door, always banging, always trying to get our attention. We need to fix our eyes on Christ. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He did everything he did in his ministry and on the cross and after for the joy set before him. He was the Lord of joy, and we need to follow his example and find joy in Christ, Jesus Christ is our true joy. And our soul will be unhappy until we find our joy in Jesus. And by the way, we will not enjoy the rest of things in life. Our families, our ministries, everything else, it loses their their luster, their joy, their, their preciousness when we don't enjoy Christ first and foremost. We should enjoy Him. And when we enjoy Christ the most, then we will enjoy the best, our marriages, our families, our food, our celebrations, our fellowship, everything else we will enjoy when we enjoy Christ. The best meals that I had in my life is when I was so fixed on Christ, then every taste was a blessing and so pleasurable. Same thing with relationships, with everything else. When my heart is fixed on Christ, every other joy and every other pleasure is intensified and it gives me so much more joy. That's why only true Christians can have the true joy. If you go to a restaurant, you have to experience the greatest joy from all other people in the restaurant. If you have your marriage, you have to experience the greatest joy because you're a Christian. Because your joy is brought under Christ. I will end by reading a quote from a pastor from 17th century, Charles Simeon. And he said the following about all the joys in life. He said the following, there are but two lessons for Christians to learn. The one is to enjoy God in everything. And the other is to enjoy everything in God. We enjoy God in everything and we enjoy everything else in God. That's the true joy. May God bless you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again and we're so thankful, Lord, that we know you, that we know the true joy in Jesus Christ, that we have forgiveness of our sins in him and this source of joy was opening to us, was opened to us as we came and trusted in Christ. We're so thankful for the gospel. We're so thankful that you have loved us And we want, Lord, as Christians, to grow in our enjoyment of you. Help us, O Lord, as we are going through trials in life. Help us, Lord, to derive more and more joy from you. As we read scriptures and as we see Christ glorious, help us, Lord, to rejoice in him. Help our people, Lord, to not pursue the joy 
of this world, the sinful pleasures of life that are deceitful and are so fleeting. Help us, Lord, to pursue the eternal and infinite and pure joy in Jesus Christ. We also pray for those who don't know you, Lord, and they hear this message. We want to see them also become truly happy. We want their happiness. And that's why we want to preach the gospel to them so that they may come to realize that everything that they are finding satisfaction is, is empty and vanity and it will fail at death. Help them, Lord, to see the vanity of their lives and to come to Christ, to repent of their rebellion and trust in Him as their Lord and Savior. Bless our people, Lord, as we are going through this pandemic and give us the joy of the Lord when we are lonely, when we are isolated from each other. Help us, Lord, to go deeper into getting to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, more. In his name I pray, amen. May God bless you, and I will see you next Sunday, 9 a.m. darkest night you thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will and if you had now love me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran, my hellbound ways, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless. Jesus is